Good afternoon. I'm Tressa Pankovitz. Thank you so much for joining us for the Reinventing America's Schools Project and the 74million.org webinar series. Today we are going to be talking about international test scores and it promises to be a very informative and important conversation. But first, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Reinventing America's Schools Project is named after a book by the same title, which was authored by our founder and now Director Emeritus, David Osborne. My co-director, Curtis Valentine, and I are continuing the work of advocating for 21st century systems of schools. To, that, that, to, the, to us, that means schools that have the autonomy to, to innovate without being constricted by centralized bureaucracy. We believe that educators who are afforded autonomy, of course, coupled with strong accountability, know their students best and can best serve them. We also believe that these kinds of schools give parents more choices and ultimately lead to greater educational equity. <laughs> the focus of today's webinar is the PISA, which is shorthand for Program for International Student Assessment. Every three years, the Organization for Cooperation, Economic Cooperation and Development gives the standardized pizza test to 15-year-old students around the world. The test we're talking about today was administered in 2022, and the results and data analysis from that test were released in December. Almost 700,000 students from 81 countries and economies took the two-hour test and then answered a 30-minute survey on other issues that could affect their um, schooling. The test is given to 15-year-olds because in many countries, that is the age at which students are still reliably enrolled in school. Joining me today, we are very honored to have literally the world's foremost experts on the PISA. And I am going to start with Dr. Peggy Carr. Dr. Carr, thank you. And could you please tell us um, a little bit about yourself and your impressive body of work? Well, thank you. Um, first of all, um, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a pleasure to be here with this distinguished panel. I wanna first uh, say, because I think it's relevant to our discussion today that I got my start in the U.S. Department of Education as the chief psychometrician for the Office for Civil Rights. So equity is something that I'm comfortable with, and I know that we're going to be touching on that today. I had a distinguished, I want to say, an honored career working with the National Assessment of Educational Progress for uh, over 20 years, uh, also known as uh, NAEP. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, hopefully, today as well. In 2021, I was appointed by President Biden uh, to be the commissioner for the National Center for Education Statistics. So now I have the pleasure of working with a full uh, portfolio of data collections for education statistics for our country as the third largest federal statistical uh, a recognized agency in the country. So I'm very, very pleased to be able to share anything coming from that side of my portfolio with our audience today. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. And we cannot wait to hear um, your take on, on both of those important tests. So thank you very much. Um, next, we have Andreas Schleicher. Thank you so much for joining us all the way from Paris. And I really hope I didn't butcher your name too badly. Um, Please uh, tell us a little bit about your work at OECD. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm in charge of OECD's uh, work on education and skills. Uh, we run surveys like PISA to get an understanding where different education systems around the world stand. But we also analyze those outcomes and provide advice for countries on how to improve education. Well, thank you. And we look forward to hearing from you because we know that there's probably nobody in the world that knows as much about the PISA as you do. And finally, let's hear from Jonathan Supovitz. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are, or good evening. You could be um, somewhere else around the world. Um, I'm John Supovitz. I'm a professor of educational policy and leadership at the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. And I also direct um, a, uh, a center called the Consortium for Policy Research in Education. And um, 
testing and assessment is an area that I have done much work on over uh, over the years, and it's kind of one of those things where I used to do a lot of work, and I'm known for it, even though it's not necessarily the focus of my latest work. Um, so it's really a great opportunity to get a chance to discuss the PISA results um, from a U.S. perspective. Excellent. Thank you so very much. So the PISA tests mathematics, reading, and science, and each year the test focuses on a different uh, subject, giving it half of the total testing time. In 2022, the focus was on math, which the OECD defines as students' capacity to reason mathematically and to formulate, employ, and interpret mathematics to solve problems in a variety of real world contexts. As you have likely heard, the results of the 2022 exam were not good. In fact, there was a historic drop in scores across OECD countries. Um, you can see the orange trend line there, which is the OECD average, while the blue line is the United States. Um, you can see that the United States is stagnant in reading and we lost 13 points in math coming down far, far below the OECD average. Andreas, can you please give us your overview of the overall outcomes and numbers and talk about what concerns you the most and what we here in the United States should be worried about? Yeah, you know, and I think you have just shown that on the screen is the gap between what our societies expect from education and need from education and what school systems deliver is becoming wider. You know, essentially, you know, skill demands are rising year after year. What you need to be able to know to be successful in your job is increasing. And we have seen essentially flatlining and recently declining learning outcomes across the OECD. And I think that is a real concern. That's not true everywhere. There is a group of countries that have actually, even in the years of the pandemic, seen real improvements in uh, in the outcomes. But that's a minority. For the bulk of countries, we really have seen a kind of quite troubling picture. In the focus area uh, in mathematics, uh, you can see the U.S. also ranking 28th out of 37 countries. So if you saw that on the screen. That's not good news. But there are some other issues that I think we should worry about. One is the large gap between students from wealthy and poor backgrounds and uh, uh, that is not just true for the U.S., absolutely not, but certainly also true for the U.S. And you cannot explain the above average social gap in the U.S. with larger social disparities in society. That used to be true in the past, but today you have a fair number of countries around the world that struggle with similar kind of social disparities in society and still manage to contain that gap in outcomes better the a third point, you know, which perhaps is less well debated, is uh, you have a relatively low level of self confidence among young people in learning autonomously. You know, today in school you have a teacher in front of you; learning is easy. But when you get out of school, you need to continue to upgrade your skills, to upskill and reskill. And what we see in the U.S. is that the share of students with confidence to be autonomous, you know, self-regulated learners is actually lower than on average across countries. And it's often in many countries, it's not good. We also see, you know, that a fairly low degree of cost effectiveness spending levels in the US are actually well above the OECD average. And uh, you could see that doesn't match the outcomes. And I think that is a concern. You know, it's how can we, you know, improve value for money Declining parental engagement. The U.S. again is not alone, but what we see in the U.S. and what we see across OECD countries is that parental engagement and support for education in 22, when we got this data, uh, was lower than in 2018. Not everywhere, but in, in many countries, including the U.S. And that clearly has a negative impact because, you know, school cannot compensate for what parents don't provide. You need to bring them on board and so on. And last but not least, um, school safety. You have a, a large share of young people who do not feel safe in their school, you know, um, in the U.S. Uh, in, in particular. In fact, in the U.S., that share of students who do not feel 
safe in their school is larger than in Ukraine, where schools are, you know, under threat every day from from external forces like a war. Now, so I think putting all of this together, the picture is not really good. But uh, I think that's true for many countries in the OECD. Did it surprise you that the level of parent engagement went down in 2022? I would think that because students were at home um, and they were learning in front of their parents in many cases um, via Zoom or whatever, that parental engagement may have increased. And that was also the time that we started seeing here in the United States a lot of activity at school board meetings where parents were coming in and protesting, you know, variety of teaching methodologies and cultural issues. So I'm, I'm interested that, that that went down. Yeah, you know, we were actually also surprised because of course the parents that we saw during the pandemic were those who were very actively engaged. But what we do not see is actually the majority of parents that, you know, may have had no time or uh, for other reasons did not actively engage. And I think that is a concern. I think it reflects the longer trend towards, you know, commodifying education. You know, students become consumers, parents become kind of clients, and teachers become some kind of service providers. And I think we've seen a growing distance between students, parents, and teachers in education that is reflected in those kinds of data. And I think it's a quite unhealthy trend because good education requires everybody. No. Yeah, for sure. And when it comes to safety, it's obviously not surprising that the United States would be um, and one of the countries that where students didn't feel as safe as in other places. But I, I thought it was interesting. One of the questions in the survey, I believe, was, um, have you ever witnessed a fight at school where someone was injured? And there were only only um, five countries and that said, you know, majority said yes. And that the United States was one of them. So that, that's, um, uh, I think I've seen somewhere too, where it was surprising that more students in the United States didn't feel even less secure than what we did see. Yeah, and you know, the five countries that were above the US uh, ones that you do not want to compare with, you know, countries like Honduras or Ecuador, you know, those are really difficult places. No? Thank you. Um, Dr. Carr, as you mentioned, you played a lead role in planning and administering the NAEP, or what people commonly know as the nation's report card. Um, Andreas painted a pretty grim picture. Well, I guess Andreas didn't paint the, the grim picture. I guess the numbers, uh, the scores paint the grim picture. But um, in the context of the nation's report card that came out in the fall, uh, do these PISA results track with that? And um, in general, you know, what, what do you think of, of the outcomes here? Well, you know, I didn't mention at the start of our uh, uh, talk here that I am uh, one of um, the vice chairs on the PISA governing board. And so uh, one of the things I had the privilege of seeing were the results of the PISA results before they were released to the world. And I was um, talked when I saw the math results uh, for PISA and the reading results for PISA for the United States because they tracked so closely with what we had reported in 20, for the 2022 data for NAEP. The math scores for NAEP, as you know, were historically low. We had never seen drops like that um, for the math data, five points for fourth graders, eight, eight points for, um, um, for I'm sorry, five points for fourth graders and eight points for eighth graders. Now, keep in mind the PISA and the NAEP are on different scales. PISA is on a thousand point scale and so NAEP is on uh, a much uh, a smaller scale, 500 points. And so the, but these drops that we're talking about were, were startling to us. And the fact that the PISA results tracked so closely um, was, uh, gave me pause. And the other thing that was very similar uh, is that for fourth graders, for, for example, we saw uh, a stronger decline at the bottom of the distribution. So the gap was actually getting wider, but for eighth graders, the decline was steep and it was even across the entire distribution, very similar to, again, what we saw for the PISA results. The other uh, interesting similarity uh, was on the reading. For reading and, and the NAEP uh, uh, study, we saw declines as well. A third of the states declined for fourth and eighth grade, and not as many as we saw for, for math. Um, but still, of course, uh, a concern. 
So the parallel that there was less decline in reading than in math between these two data collections, large scale data collections, with very similar uh, approaches to measuring these constructs was, um, uh, gave you pause that triangulating across different assessments, we're seeing the same, uh, the same problem. I think it is important for the United States to participate in studies like PISA because they give us the context um, relative to the entire world, the OECD countries in particular. Uh, because uh, uh, for NAEP, reading has always been a concern, but when you look at the reading results for PISA, we don't do as, um, as poorly as we do in math in comparison to our, our, our uh, peers in OECD and other participating countries. So it's important to put these data in context is what I would take away. Math clearly is very sensitive to instruction, what's going on uh, in the classroom, reading not uh, as much. There were some who were somewhat of naysayers when the NAEP came out. They seemed to kind of minimize the level of the drop um, or to sort of brush it away that it's just a temporary situation. Does the PISA test coming on top of the NAEP and tracking so closely, is that a bigger evidence base that we really have a problem? Oh, we definitely have a problem. And the uh, distribution uh, of the drops um, reiterate that where the problem is, uh, that those students who are struggling the most um, were impacted the most by the pandemic. And, and these, uh, these data tell us a story about where we need to be focusing. Oh, I, I think that when you triangulate across different assessments that are measuring the same construct, but in different ways, then this, it reiterates and verifies that what we're looking at is real. Thank you so much. Um, Jonathan, you authored an excellent article titled Five Takeaways from the PISA exam results. And your final takeaway was the results only matter to the extent that we talk about them. That statement actually contributed to my uh, my idea to pursue this panel today. So we are talking about them. Um, can, can you explain what you meant by that and how we can encourage needed changes when, as you noted, education uh, debates are also very politically volatile? Um, sure, I, and this really builds on um, the comments of Andreas and, and Peggy that, you know, when we think about what a test is, it's really sampling from a domain of knowledge. And um, so um, PISA is sampling from um, a broad sense of what 15-year-olds um, should be able to know and do. Um, NAEP also um, is really um, not connected to any particular curriculum in the United States. And um, the other distinction between PISA and NAEP and other perspectives that we that we get that we pay a lot of attention to are their, um, their relative um, distinction from state tests, which of course students um, and schools and districts and states, um, those are the accountability measures that we use. And so when we see um, there's there's been a lot of wonderful studies that show that when you introduce a, a state test which has accountability attached to it, performance grows over time relative to NAEP or PISA where performance is a lot more stable and steady. And so, which which indicates that people are are teaching to the test and learning the forms of the test, et cetera. But there are no stakes attached to NAEP or PISA, and so in some ways they're pure assessments that are on the good side that they're not you know that people aren't using motivation as a means to try and perform well on the test, and therefore they're they're um, they're pure indicators. On the uh, on the flip side, 
um, they are, as I said, unconnected to any particular curriculum or approach that's used. And in a state, they're they're much more tied to state standards, et cetera. So, um, so I think that the, you know, to build on what Peggy said, that they really are connected, or they, they give us the opportunity to get these perspectives that we wouldn't otherwise have. But those perspectives need to be um, seen as opportunities for us to ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why is it that um, that math performance um, was so much lower than um, than reading and science performance? Um, why is it in the United States that um, although math performance declined, um, the 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 prior gaps in performance were not exacerbated in math? Um, something that Andreas, I hope we'll talk about, which I found really fascinating was, which is a new thing, is the use of technology and particularly the use of technology um, in leisure time and its negative relationship with performance, which I think is going to be a growing phenomenon and that really, you know, spotlights the, um, the, the capital hearings with all the um, with all the social media companies uh, just the other day. So, you know, I think that these, these international perspectives and Nate give us an opportunity to really sit back and reflect and ask important questions that can drive our system forward that are not highly connected to um, the pressure packed um, state tests, which we view as our accountability measures. I forgot to mention at the top, this is very much a panel discussion. So if you want to ask questions of each other, I do not have a problem with that. But uh, Jonathan, you actually foreshadowed my my next question um, to Andreas. But before I move on to that, um, from your perspective, how do we get more people talking about this? You said it was important that we talk about it. And I mean, I think if you went into an average, whether suburban, urban school, and asked a parent, so what do you think of the PISA scores? You'd probably get a pretty blank stare. So how do we raise awareness? And I, I, I would, I would say that this would be a great question for Dr. Carr as well. Well, um, I'll, I'll pass over to Peggy in a second, but you're doing it right here, right? The more we talk about these points, and the more we raise awareness of them, and just the way that you, you know, connected with me, right? So the more chances we have to to engage in discussions the the residual effect of that is going to be to raise awareness and to have people talking about them i would say that you know there are certainly in state offices lots of conversations about what's happening in with pisa peggy did you have anything to add to that yeah. on awareness yeah it's a it's a fascinating um set of questions around what parents think a lot of parents think that things are are okay in their schools when you talk to them one on one, and uh, many of them are not aware of the um, the recovery um, task that we have in front of us. They think that things are going to sort of snap back, but the results we need to wake up. I think is the kind of conversation we need to have with our parents because this is not business as usual. There is recovery happening. I don't know if you saw the um, the study uh, results uh, just released by the Equity Education Project at Harvard and Stanford uh, Collaborative. And there, there, There is progress being made. And ironically, Jonathan, I'd love to hear what you think about this. More progress is being made in math than in reading. They reported about a, a 40 uh, a, percent or maybe 30, 35 percent recovery for math and something like a quarter for reading. So recovery is happening, but it's not happening equally. So those parents that uh, think that this is a passing um, issue, well, they need to think again. And this is the kind of serious conversation we need to have with them because students who are um, struggling, poor students, for example, students of color, they are recovering, but not as quick as their counterparts. So the gaps are actually wider than they were in 
uh, 20, uh, 2019. So there's a lot of work to be done. So we need to be honest, I think, with our parents and, and those who are working with boots on the ground about the amount of work that is um, ahead of us. So can I ask you a slightly controversial question about that? Um, I mean, when you have the U.S. Secretary of Education um, saying positive things because we moved up in the rankings, but yet when we know that we only the U.S. only moved up in the rankings because other countries did so much worse than us, does that make it harder to get the message through to parents when, when leaders do not be bold face honest and say say some of the things that you've said today about having a problem. I'm just talking simply from a people taking it seriously angle. Well, certainly I can't talk about what's in the head of the secretary, but what I can say is that here in the department, we had a serious discussion about these PISA results. I mean, everyone is clear that we improved in our rankings, but it was uh, at the cost of others who didn't do quite as well uh, as we did. Uh, we did decline in math, uh, as as uh, Andreas and I have both said, but we didn't decline as much as some of our peers did uh, in math. And and as a result, our rankings improved. But you know, is that the cost of you know the entire um, uh, portfolio of scores? And I don't think anyone here in in our department is this is something that they did not know. This did not fall on deaf deaf ears. But um, also in the uh, PISA results, what we found is that this controversy around school openings, for example, Andreas, maybe you could say a little bit more about that. The United States was closed more than many of uh, its uh, uh, its peers. Uh, it, but um, it did not necessarily seem to, to have a correlation with the results. So their decline wasn't as bad as some of their peers. Uh, you know, when you look at what the uh, opening and closing pattern was. So it's a sort of a mixed bag, I think. There's a lot of rich information out of both the PISA and the, uh, and the NAEP study. But uh, hopefully you're going to get to this because we need to focus on more than what goes on in the classroom. Uh, the whole child needs to be part of the discussion here. Sure. Um, and and you foreshadowed another question that I have for Andrea. So let me go back to the digital. Well, let's just stay for, on school closings for a minute here. So that's the immediate topic. We'll come back to the digital because that's fascinating as well. Um, I was a little confused as well because we've heard nothing but you know learning loss and school closings but then let's see um i read in the report that there was no clear trend between countries um like brazil ireland and jamaica that experienced very long closures and countries with short closures like sweden uh, iceland and taipei on the results so can you clear it up for once and once and for all how much of the pandemic is response pandemic disruption is responsible for the score drops on the, on the uh, PISA? Yeah, you know, I think there are several things going on. First of all, we do see a clear cross country pattern between the lengths of school cl closures and outcomes. But as Peggy has said, there are uh, really interesting exceptions. Some countries with very long school closures have been remarkably resilient, and others with short school school closures uh, drop. But you know, overall. Clearly, the pandemic has been a factor in this in this right. latest drop, but it's not the only one. You know, I think there are a number of, you know, uh, technology use actually to, to some extent, technology use for leisure has a stronger relationship with the drop in outcomes mm -hmm. than the pandemic. So I think we need to look at the outcomes as uh, sort of um, there are multiple things going on. But clearly, you know, school closures have worked against education. I don't think there's any any mm -hmm. any doubt yeah. about that. Let's un let's just unpack that a little bit for the audience here because um, uh, yeah, people might not be so familiar with this. So, um, Andreas, as I understand it, the PISA measured two things: technology use in school and technology use out of school. And it and the out of school component is what you're calling technology use for leisure. And that was the piece that was really negatively correlated with student performance. Is, am I reading that right? 
Yeah, actually, uh, it is a uh, technology used for leisure in schools. That oh, it's we, in school. Uh, okay. Yeah. So basically, students having their smartphones in school and uh, or their the personal tablets and. Uh, I guess, you know, if we would look at uh, technology use out of school, you'd probably see the same pattern. I mean, it's it's very clear that, uh, but we were particularly interested in to what extent students feel distracted, you know, by, you know, using their own devices, to what extent they feel, you know, addicted to that, you know, feeling nervous when they, or anxious when they don't have them. And uh, uh, these patterns are actually quite concerning. You know, I, on the one hand, you know, I think there is enormous potential for technology and education, you know, it can make learning more granular, more adaptive, can enhance equity, it can, you know, learning analytics, you know, I, yesterday I just came back from China, there are just amazing things happening, you know, using technology actually for improving learning. But the bottom line is the patterns are far from consistent. We cannot even say that technology used for instruction is a force for good, you know, actually the line is pretty flat. You know, technology intensity in classrooms and outcomes are not very clearly correlated. What we do see very, very clearly is that where students use their own devices for their own purposes in school, that is very, and then you see that pattern across the board. You know, there's no country that escapes that, uh, is strongly negatively correlated with, with outcomes. Uh, and uh, I'm not even saying just with mathematics. You can see those students also feel, you know, a poorer social relationship, they feel greater levels of anxiety, they feel, you know, less happy with their lives. So I think there are many, you never know, you know, the direction of cause and effect in those things, but there's a very clear association, negative association between technology use for leisure in schools and uh, a whole range of outcomes. I thought so, it was really for, interesting. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that the report found that 29% of uh, res student respondents had used a cell phone at school within two weeks of being given the test, even in places where they were banned. So mm. it's like even bans don't always work. Well, actually, you have to say that the countries that have bans on cell phones see a lot less of a negative effect. But as you say, you know, uh, uh, what we saw clearly from the data is what school leaders and teachers tell students is not, you know, particularly effective. Uh, where there are bans, the ban on cell phones was the only kind of factor that seemed to mediate that negative relationship somewhat. <clears throat> but as you say, there were lots of, you know, students bypassing that in one or the other way. Interesting. I'm sorry, Jonathan, you had a question. No, I was just going to, um, well, A, thank uh, Andreas for clarifying that. But this is, this is so um, prescient for a whole bunch of debates going on in, in school districts around the country about how to, what policies they should, um, they should introduce around um, students bringing their phones to school, around using them within school. And I think that these data can really inform those conversations. So talking about the relevance of these results in national conversations, this is really important. I, I, like, I was going to uh, yeah, yeah, I was just going to add and foreshadow um, that the NAEP uh, is uh, going to be looking at this uh, issue in his next data collection. We have a module that we um, have uh, put in for uh, schools and and for students around the use of this technology in school. So uh, we'll have more information, stay tuned, more information on this uh, in the in the next NAEP data collection. I didn't know we would get a new scoop here today. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my next question leads into what you said about the need to talk about the whole child. Um, you know, I guess the numbers were that um, only 11% of disadvantaged children uh, in America landed in the top quartile of math scores. Mm -hmm. um, but as we've heard, even affluent students in the United States did not match the scores of average performing students in Japan, South yeah. Korea, and Hong Kong. So first, this is a two-parter. Um, what do we need to do uh, to address the needs of our disadvantaged students? Well, you know, I think if you look at those countries, you know, you mentioned Hong Kong and Japan, uh, 
teachers in those countries have just a lot of more opportunities to actually understand where students are needing extra support and then to provide it. You know, they have often fewer teaching hours than teachers in the US, but longer working hours. And so they can spend a lot more time with students outside the classroom settings for individual support. They can spend more time with the parents. They can spend more time with other teachers and they are also in charge. You know, if in Japan, if you as a student, if you get in trouble with the police, the police is not going to call your parents, but your teacher. So actually you are really responsible for their well-being. You know, at the end of the the school day, Japanese teachers uh, clean the schoolhouse with their students because they're all in this together. They cook the meals for lunch. And so there's a very close relationship between students and teachers. And that, you know, creates an environment in which the poorest uh, or most disadvantaged schools get actually really, really good support. The teachers just know who they are, who they want to become. They accompany them on their journey. And teachers are accountable not for the average score in the class but for every student's success so that's also where you know things like mastery learning come from you know they basically do not lower the expectation for a student from a disadvantaged background but they redouble the support i think that's uh there's uh, they're really powerful lessons that we can learn from from east asia because you know uh, japan is perhaps not the best example for this but you go to kind of systems like hong kong you find extreme poverty and uh, still, those kids match the performance of the average uh, student in the U.S. No? Would you say that in more countries than than half or where, how many places is teaching like that the norm? Is it pretty much limited to East Asia or do you see it, all, are, are is the United States really an outlier when it comes to that? Or are we more in line with Western Europe? Where do we fit into that picture? Well, I think you see similar uh, positive pictures in uh, Northern Europe. I think there's a very strong focus also on, you know, teachers being responsible, not just for knowledge transmission, but really for a whole range of student outcomes. They, the, the kind of social welfare and the cognitive development are seen, you know, as the task of, of teachers. And the work is organized uh, around that. I think that's the real difference, that school in those systems is is fairly comprehensively responsible for a range of outcomes. And if people talk about Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Estonia are good examples. I would say, actually, even, you know, you can look to the Netherlands, you can look uh, uh, to, to Portugal, in, in Europe, uh, I would also say North America, Canada, a good example. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, that actually manages the, the social gap uh, also quite well. So I think um, there is a whole range of, of countries. It's not limited to one 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 culture, but you can find it's it's really a, a more a question of policy and work organization than you know geography or culture. Dr. Carr, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on that and also what I was saying about um, our disadvantaged children in the U.S. It doesn't sound like the way our school districts are structured or with um, the influence of teachers unions that we have the ability to replicate the type of teaching uh, and social network, uh, social um, safety net if you will, that teachers provide in other countries. But at the same time, we know that our disadvantaged children need a lot of extra help. So that's kind of a convoluted yeah. question, but I'm really just wanting to hear your wisdom on that. Yeah, you, you make a really good point. When you look at the entire distribution for PISA, you'll see that, you know, our tail is sort of fat. I'll put it in that in that terms at, at, at the bottom in comparison to many of our counterparts, particularly in math. It means that we're struggling uh, in math and our lower performing students are particularly struggling. Now, everything's a normal curve. So we do have students at the top. I was looking at the PISA data uh, just prior to our, our talk here. And we have um, in our higher performing levels on PISA, around 7% or so, the students are at that top level, five and above. But when you compare to these the countries that uh, Andreas is describing, Japan, Hong Kong, or not, that's not a country, but um, Korea, they're like um, triple what you see in the United States. So I just want to underscore your point that we're not, we, we have students uh, that are doing well, but certainly not, uh, not as many. And so there is a lot of work to do. That's in math, but in reading, 
when you look at our higher performers, we are some of the higher performers in, in the world. So this is so important for us to understand where we need to focus by um, concatenating these results across these, these uh, different assessments. I also want uh, to, uh, to point out that um, the, the fourth grade is different from the eighth grade in terms of what, what we're seeing. You know, this is, this is uh, another reason why we need to think about the whole child and where the child is developed mentally as we think about uh, how uh, to help them uh, recover. For people uh, in the audience who might not be as familiar with the term whole child, could you explain what you mean by that or what that looks like? And, and I didn't mean to interrupt your, your yeah. thought. No, it's a good point. Uh, Jonathan said it earlier. Why don't we, we break this down for our audience? I think that mental health, uh, for example, something that we have been focusing on, I think as a country, and certainly we've been measuring mental health across a number of our data collections, is one of the areas that I think define an important aspect of the whole child. Uh, students are struggling with um, uh, uh, issues of behavior, um, bullying is up, cyberbullying particularly is up. You mentioned uh, about what ha is happening in our schools in terms of crime and, and safety. Uh, our crime and safety indicators uh, indicate that we're still struggling with regard to uh, that aspect of students' mental health. And it's actually not just students, it's the teachers as well. Our um, uh, school uh uh, assessment of where students are and students and schools are doing once a month with our, our school panel survey indicates that teachers are also uh, struggling with mental health. And if we leave this conversation without mentioning chronic absenteeism, shame on us, because that is another problem that has emerged that, and, that is part of this bigger whole child problem that we have. I was shocked because I'm, I'm not going to get the exact number right. Andreas will know off the top of his head, but it was something like 21 countries or 31 countries attendance and um, punctuality improved since the last, mm. test, even in the face of the pandemic. And I also noticed, which I thought was really um, interesting, that almost every country where absenteeism and tardiness became a big problem was in the Western world, Western Europe, Canada, mm. the United States. And I, I don't know what that means exactly. Maybe we're, we're too soft. I don't know, but um, yeah. you know, I, why would you think, and I'm sorry, John, Jonathan, I am going to let you get in a word edgewise here, but Andreas, why do you think some places saw improved attendance in one of the most difficult periods in recent history and other places saw such a drop off? Well, you know, you get some clues when you actually look at the reasons why students said that they're absent. Of course, you know, there are some health related issues and so on. But, you know, uh, the, 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 the most important non-health related issue was I was bored. No? In effect, you know, the many young people who no longer see that school is, you know, relevant to their current and maybe future life. And I think that's something that we should be uh, taking quite, quite, quite seriously and, uh, uh, but overall, I must say the picture is positive. You know, I think maybe the pandemic has also, you know, reminded young people that school may be not such a bad place. You know, you have actually a, <clears throat> a fairly stable social environment and it may have helped. Uh, but um, <clears throat> I do think that um, uh, when you look at those students who do not go to school, there seems a clear pattern. You know, it is either, you know, health and well-being or it is that school isn't just interesting. Maybe we need uh, from the from the uh, Department of Education, maybe we need a campaign like just say no to drugs. Uh, just get your kids to school to, hmm. <laughs> to uh, try to do something proactive to change the thinking around that. I'm sorry, Jonathan, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to um, build on this this conversation that um, Boredom is one thing, but a sense of belonging in school yeah. um, is another. Yeah. And um, Andreas, I believe that yeah. there's a positive relationship between performance and sense of belonging. And um, we're doing a big project around um, around cultural responsiveness and how to engage school 
school um, teachers and leaders and with the backgrounds of students and their, and their community to try to connect, make more connections between what happens in school and, um, and um, students' prior experiences. And so I think that this is, uh, this is an important area to look at as well. Yeah, John, Tony, you're absolutely right. I mean, sense of belonging is actually one of the strongest predictors as well that we see that, uh, uh, and uh, it is closely related to the uh, perceived support that students uh, feel from their teachers and and factors like that. So I think this is worth looking at. Jonathan, while while you have the floor, um, I wanted to come back to the teaching aspect. Uh, so put your graduate school of education professor hat on and um, let's talk about the type of teachers that are elsewhere in the world, as Andreas mentioned, and the types of teachers that our schools of education are producing. Is there something that we can be doing in these colleges of education differently to build a different culture amongst teachers? And I'm not bashing teachers. I know there's a million hardworking teachers who, you know, give it their all every day. But um, clearly our teaching is not um, the same as it is in other places of the world that are seeing better educational outcomes. So let me make a couple of points about this. One is that um, you know, in my long career in education, there's been a lot of critique about what what value does education, does school really add to students, and um, and you know what 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 are, what are we really contributing to students, and what's the value added? And you know, in a horrifying way, this was this COVID was an existence proof of what happens if you pull the rug out of education and what happens to student performance. So, so I actually think that that the um, the the rebound, um, the declines and the rebound is really a testament to all the hard work that that teachers around the world do. Um, having said that, um, and and. I think there are a lot of hints in PISA and Andreas can build on this, that it's partially, it, you know, it might be what teachers do, but it's more the systems around teachers, the, the way that we organize curriculum, the way that we organize time, um, the efficiency of the system in, um, in introducing concepts. And in the US, we tend to repeat the same concepts over and over again as students move across levels as opposed to building mastery and um, and moving kids through curriculum. So, you know, I, I certainly think that, that um, we can do better um, in colleges of education around preparing teachers, but um, it's there's a bigger conversation to be had. Andreas, do you wanna build on that with curriculum? Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, uh, the the design of the instructional system is a very clear kind of factor here. I would also say, you know, uh, what makes teaching intellectually attractive is not just a matter of, you know, pay, uh, but to what extent, you know, does teaching, you know, provide opportunities for teachers to relate to students, opportunities for working with their colleagues, opportunities for advancing in their careers. And when you look at countries where teaching is, you know, attractive, you typically find those things are, are, are very well developed. I think also, you know, the way you, you uh, again, you know, develop the instructional systems, including curriculum, I think all of those things do, do matter a lot. And um, the kind of learning opportunities that teachers themselves have in school, to what extent does the school support the continued professional development? I think there's a whole range of, of factors that we need to look at. But very clearly, you know, education system can be better than the quality of teaching. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, Dr. Cart, there's one other topic that I want to make sure that we get to today, and we do have some questions from the audience, so I want to leave a little time um, to, to uh, let you all address that. I know people are excited to get their questions heard. Um, we touched on it earlier, but we saw that um, even affluent students in the US were not keeping up with the average student in those Asian countries that I miss mentioned, Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong, I believe it was, perhaps Japan. Um, do 
we have a false sense of security in this country that unless we're talking about a poor urban school, our schools are pretty good. We know that people complain about the school system, but we also know that when parents are asked, they tend to like the school yeah, that their yeah. child. And I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there may be people in this country, a lot of them, who think that their schools are giving their kids a better education than they actually are, based on the PISA, at least. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it rings true. I, I think the data uh, show that uh, parents really think their schools are doing okay. Uh, but when you look at the bigger picture, that is not that is not always true. And I would like for us to focus on where the problem is. It is not uh, where I think people think it is. It is not in reading, for example. It doesn't appear to be in science. It is in math. That is where our big problem is. If we're going to be the first in the world in anything, we can't do it without math. And uh, this is where I think we need to focus. And as it ironically, as it uh, is panning out in the data, math is very sensitive to mm -hmm. in school instruction. So we could really focus on in these areas in a very uh, um, concentrated way. Are you concerned? Are you concerned about what's happening with math in California? Say more. I cannot remember the exact phraseology, but it is some kind of new math that they are looking to. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I I don't want to get in uh, to that. Okay. It's a little, little uh, sticky just, there. Um, but I yes. just read, I, I just read that some math professors are very concerned about the direction that California is going in in math, and that they're adopting curriculum that's not proven, and that there's a concern that we're gonna end up in the same place as we did with literacy. Um, so anyways. You know what I would say to that? I'm gonna echo something Jonathan said earlier about a PISA and a NAEP, and quite honestly, even uh, attempts. Uh, they're dropped from the sky assessments. They are not tied to any curriculum. They are um, not high stakes. So whatever's going on in California, we're gonna know we're going to have the truth tellers, the second opinion, the elephant in the room to say what, uh, how they're actually doing. That's the value of these kinds of assessments. Very, very good point. Andreas, before I go to the questions from the audience, I have one more question for you, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned the fact that the United States is above average in spending, um, but we are not what did you get it getting a good return on investment perhaps something like that um what do you think we should be spending our money on that we're not if we're not getting the kind of results that other countries that spend less are getting you know it's an it's an it's a really interesting question you know i mean uh you spend a lot more than the oecd average and still you succeed to pay your teachers very little and that is the kind of unhealthy mix now, if you look at countries that you know uh, uh do better they typically make teaching uh, reasonably financially attractive sometimes they pay for that with larger classes now that's a trade off that the us makes in the inverse you have sort of prioritized smaller classes over you know uh, uh, uh teacher pay and uh I would also say non-teaching working time, which I think is incredibly important that teachers do have time for other things than teaching, like yeah. you know, uh, caring for students, working with parents, working with their colleagues, and all of that is sort of sacrificed in, in, in the US. And uh, uh, the last factor is that you have almost half of the money in the US that doesn't end up in the classroom. Now, and if you would go to Japan, that is just 10% of money that is spent on other things. And, uh, the, the share of money that is related to the classroom is the only one that can ultimately contribute to improved outcomes. And I think so. You put all of this together, uh, I, I think there's a lot of room for a more effective uh, use of resources. And uh, if you look at high-performing countries, whenever they have to make a choice between a smaller class or a better teacher, they invest in the teacher. If you look at high-performing countries, they do give their teachers time for 
for important things other than uh, than classroom instruction and uh, they they actually invest in the quality of relationships in the school with parents with students and 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 those those factors no thank you okay i'm going to just hit a couple of these questions um real quick um and i'm just going to let whoever feels that they want to answer, answer. Um, what is the role of out of school practice and homework, which seems to be eliminated in many schools while increased in others? Where, what, where are the trends with regards to extended learning in participating countries? Andreas, Dr. Carr, <laughs> either one of you want to answer that? I'll, I'll bow to Andreas first. Yeah, you know, I think this it's a really interesting question. We see very <laughs> a lot of variability in the out of both in school learning time varies a lot across countries, and also the out of school learning time, including homework. And uh, um, we do see actually generally a positive relationship between uh, volume of homework and uh, and learning outcomes uh, to some extent, also between additional tutoring. Um, but I would make another argument here, and I think it's very important in today's world that students learn to work to le uh, learn to learn on their own, that they take responsibility for some of their learning. And uh, uh, I do think homework is one of the ways in which you can actually uh, uh, facilitate that. Other people say, well, it works against equity. You know, students from disadvantaged backgrounds not having that much opportunity. But uh, we see some of the countries with very high levels of homework uh, also actually doing really well on equity so i think it leads in a cross-country analysis that is not so much borne out by the data dr carr did you have anything to add or shall i go to the next question well let me just say very quickly that our school pulse panel survey the one that goes in every 30 days or so uh, asked teachers about extended time uh, work um, beyond the school day and a lot of schools are doing this is a strategy and that at least from the perspectives of the principals and the administrators, it makes a difference. Um, whether it's uh, demonstrative enough uh, to get us out of where we are, I think um, uh, time will tell, but my guess is that it is not the only factor that is needed mm. to pull us out of recovery. Understood. Um, do countries that have centralized education systems uh, perform better than countries with decentralized education systems? Is that a factor that you see in any of the trends? Hmm. Not really, actually. We have studied that quite carefully and uh, you cannot see a pattern. There are some countries set with devolved responsibility. The only factor that we can associate with improved performance is a uh, uh, level of local responsibility. So where you have higher degrees of school autonomy, there you can see a kind of statistically relevant relationship, at least a correlation. But at the system level, you have some very successful devolved systems. Think about Canada. You have some very successful centralized systems. Think of Japan, Korea. So I think that's difficult to, to state. Well, I would love to do a whole nother hour uh, webinar focusing just on the autonomy uh, is aspect. Um, that's what we like at uh, Reinventing America's Schools, coupled with accountability, of course. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So um, I want to give each of you 30 seconds to just make one final comment. Um, always let my guests get the last word. So Dr. Carr. Uh, I would just emphasize a part of our discussion today, the focus on the whole child. Um, because recovery uh, is going to not be the same uh, for uh, our students. And so we need to think about what the child needs in order, in order to um, show recovery, put them where they need to be. And we didn't all start at the same level, and we're not all going to finish at the same level and, until we focus on what the child needs to uh, regain recovery. Uh, Andreas? Yeah, you know, I, I look at international comparisons in the way that, you know, they show us that the, all of the problems that we discuss here can actually be successfully addressed. I think this is what we can learn from the highest performing systems. We are not talking about something that is impossible. And in principle, you know, the U.S. 
uh, it is in a very good position in having the resources. You know, you do have actually the level of funding in education uh, to to put, I think, uh, the solutions in place. Jonathan? Um, I just want to, well, first of all, thank all of my colleagues here for, for the great conversation and Tressa for you and, um, and the organization for sponsoring this. But I just want to end with the distinction between performance and learning. Um, PISA, NAEP, um, state tests, they're all measures of performance, which is the product of learning. Um, teachers need feedback on the um, how students are thinking about content because it's it's how students are thinking that's going to give teachers the insight to um, improve learning to produce performance. And so um, so I just want to give a, um, a, a shout out to um, attention to um, learning tools that will help teachers to achieve the performance that we all desire. Thank you so much. Um, to the person in the chat who uh, asked to see the graphic again, if you find me on the uh, Progressive Policy Institute website and message me, I will send actually anybody that's tuned in that wants that graph. It is in the PISA report. It's not my graph, but I'm happy to share it. Um, and thank you to every one of my guests. Thank you to the audience. I see an extraordinary number of you stayed till the very end. I hope this was informative. I found it fascinating. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.